Uh, still not sure whether it's better to be before lunch or after lunch. How are you feeling? A lot of plant-based options, which was great. All right, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to try and walk a really fine line between giving a dose of reality, which has been lacking earlier, I think, and um, while staying excited and enthusiastic about the future. Um, so the notion of this being a journey, which I think is the great title of this section, um, we're going to try and talk about how we can plot a journey from the classical present, hopefully, to the quantum future. All right. Um, as Christy has said, I'm the general manager of Amazon Rocket, which is the quantum computing service of AWS we launched about three years or so ago. Um, all right, whenever we talk about um, innovation in AWS, um, is there any chance I could get the notes on the screen? It's not showing up, doesn't matter. When you talk about um, uh, innovation at AWS um, and Amazon, we sort of returned to the notion of a flywheel. I talked about uh, the concept of an innovation flywheel last year and got a lot of uh, positive feedback that it was useful, so I thought I'd double down on it a little bit more. So there is the urban legend that, um, uh, that Amazon sort of started on the back of a napkin, okay? This, this idea that um, you could have a virtuous circle, a selection of products drives customer experience, which drives traffic, which drives more vendors, which drives more product and more choice, and round and round it goes and everything goes crazy. But there's more to it than that. Um, the outer loop is really where I think it gets interesting because it starts to be a force multiplier. It starts to amplify the benefits. So as that middle circle increases in velocity, it drives growth, and that growth creates a platform to reduce prices, so costs, sorry, which triggers lower prices, which generally accumulates an even better customer experience. So we call it the innovation flywheel. Um, and AWS has applied this same concept. You know, every document you read at Amazon talks about how you apply this to a new business or whatever it might be, and it seems to work. You know, we've applied it to robotics or to game tech, uh, to IoT, and you know, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that there is one for quantum. Um, so it starts with that sort of inner virtuous circle, the idea that if you can give access to customers to decent quantum computing hardware, um, then that will trigger a flurry of innovation around uh, applications and use cases, which will generally get you know, this community excited enough to fund more and better hardware, and so it carries on. And eventually, we get to the world of quantum advantage and doing something useful. But again, there's this notion of um, this sort of second limb. You know? So as all this stuff speeds up, we start to build a platform, because at the end of the day, um, the thing's really, this doesn't get interesting until applications actually start showing up. You need to generate, ultimately, a platform that can attract you know, an ecosystem of consultants uh, or educators uh, or application providers to actually build on top of the hardware, because hardware on its own you know, is interesting, but it's you know, sort of not much more than the science project. What it needs is applications to bring it alive. So we believe at Amazon that if we build a platform, then an ecosystem can build around it. Uh, we can generate applications, and that will bootstrap, essentially, and force multiply the benefits that are being made and the innovations happening in the hardware cycle. And really, that's why we launched Amazon Bracket. We decided it was time to knock down some of those barriers and make it easy, fundamentally, for folks to get their hands on hardware and build on a solid platform. When we talk about platform, we're thinking about things like operational experience, um, security, different commercial models, you know, and ultimately creating you know, environments like a marketplace. You know, AWS is famous for having a large commercial marketplace where third-party software vendors can provide uh, and software solutions and be discovered in general. So we think that sort of concept can only apply to quantum you know, at some point in the future as well. So the title of this session was all about a town square. Um, as I said, Bracket launched about three years or so ago, and we often get asked, you know, what's our vision for the service? And it, and it really is, you know, trying to bring the community together. That sort of sounds a little bit cliche, uh, but it is what we've done in other markets, and it does seem to work. Um, I think it's really important, because it's a big, big difference. Most of the other uh, web services that are out there, where, through which you can get your hands on quantum hardware, they're basically there to show off a piece of hardware. They're basically there to convince the world that this box is better than that box. That's fundamentally not what we're about. We, we're very strong believers that the way to success is to, is to essentially create competition and to stimulate innovation where customers can really get a sense of what's happening in the marketplace, 
you know, what really are the really interesting edge cases for these different technologies and where we see the points of light in terms of delivering real computational value. So when we talk about bringing a community together, of course, that's everybody. That's multiple hardware vendors. You know, we don't pick any winners. It's far, far too early for that. But also software developers and educators and researchers uh, and consultants. It's a great example. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we announced uh, a relationship with the University of Edinburgh, part of the NQCC, to create a quantum uh, software lab. So I think it's a great example of how we can start building a community on top of this, of this core infrastructure. All right. When you think about a quantum service, um, I'm going fast, we don't have much time. Um, it's obvious you think about hardware first. You know, it's the thing that's either holding the industry back or enabling the industry to go forward, whichever way you look at it. Um, it's the inner circle of that flywheel, giving customers access to the best hardware ultimately starts to unlock the power of potential applications. So our goal is to make that as easy as possible, remove some of those barriers. You know, customers tell us over and over again that they don't want to get locked into a particular type of hardware. They don't want to get framed into a particular ecosystem. They want to be able to leap between different devices, compare the trajectory of different types of hardware and different manufacturers, and try to align that hardware with particular use cases uh, and applications. So in the end, our goal is to have different examples of each of the modalities. Um, this morning, we had a session talking about the different types of quantum computers. I think somebody said there were seven or so different ways of building these machines, which is about right. Um, our goal is to have at least one example of every one of those modalities available on the service. Um, last year, uh, we launched uh, Oxford Quantum Circuits, the Lucy device. I think Ilana's here somewhere uh, at the back, I think. Um, that was great. So that was our first European uh, based hardware device on the service, and we hope to add more uh, you know, in the next year or two. Um, we launched just after that the, uh, the Borealis device from Xanadu. So Xanadu, this was the first device that was, uh, uh, that was publicly accessible that had claimed quantum supremacy. So the notion that a quantum device can do something that a classical machine can't do or could never do. Uh, those claims have been made before, but not in a way that you could publicly test the claim. So for the first time, that was possible uh, on bracket. And then towards the end of last year, we launched uh, a neutral atom device uh, from a company called Quera. Uh, just based in, in Boston. Um, really interesting, 256 qubits, uh, atom-based, and so not gate-based, not a universal machine. Um, different paradigm completely, different programming concept completely, and I think that's really important. You know, it's very easy to get locked into the mindset that quantum algorithms are about gates and about circuits. It doesn't have to be that way. There's lots of different ways you can think about programming these devices, and, uh, and, and that's we're excited to bring QA to the device. Really important. This is not just a bunch of logos you know, on a slide. Uh, we run an operational service. So Amazon Bracket complies with all of the rules and regs of any AWS service. Uh, and we hold ourselves to a very high bar in terms of operational integrity. You know, these devices are available you know, every day, day in, day out, pay as you go, on demand. You know, they're all there. Um, no subscriptions, which of course is a mantra of, you know, of the cloud, no monthly fees, none of that stuff. Just go play, um, pay as you go. Um, speaking of new devices, um, I wanted to announce actually something. We, uh, we launched just today um, INQ's latest device, the Aria machine, um, their largest, highest fidelity device that's publicly available, uh, now available on Bracket. Uh, again, pay as you go, uh, no fees, no monthly charges, uh, 25 qubits. Uh, as you know, uh, Iron Traps, the big advantage they have is all to all connectivity, so more efficient in terms of uh, using gates. Uh, it's the first device available on bracket uh, that supports error mitigation. Uh, you can turn it on or off. So if you're in the business of researching error mitigation, and you will have probably detected by now that uh, error mitigation is one of the hot topics, you know, figuring out how we can reduce the error rate in these machines is critical. You know, um, it's one of the first opportunities that we've had to have two devices from two different generations from the same manufacturer on the service. So that's really important, I think, because that allows you to gauge you know, velocity. Questions always from customers are, you know, when is this stuff real? You know, when is it going to get useful? So having sort of two points on that curve in two generations to get a sense of how INQ, in this case, has, has moved from the Harmony device to the Aura device in terms of performance is a great way for customers to try and plot that trajectory. So 
It's available now. Uh, the Harmony device is also available. So again, on demand, uh, you can switch between those two devices, a single line of code, uh, and see how they differ. Uh, later this afternoon, uh, I think somebody mentioned the drinks party, which we're pleased to host. And uh, my friend Anand from Iron Q is uh, down the front here. So, you know, we're both happy to chat about that. And they have a booth in the hallway where I'm sure they'll tell you more about the device. All right. Certainly no ding against Iron Q or any of our other hardware partners, but Quantum on its own is sort of interesting. Quantum machines sort of useful, but it is a bit of a science project. You know, what brings these things to life is, at the end of the day is applications. Um, and those applications are always going to involve classical computers. The notion that somehow a quantum computer replaces a classical machine you know, is nonsense. These things are coprocessors to classical systems. And um, you know, it's always useful to think about you know, how we can um, explore the interplay between classical and quantum systems, because sort of that, what, that's what I mean by the outer band you know, of this innovation hype cycle. So the hardware is sort of the inner loop. When you think of the outer cycle, that's really how we can start to engage the software and the application community and how we can build a platform that they feel they, that they can trust, essentially that they can build a business on, okay, in the context of quantum. Um, today, we don't really know what those applications are. You know, it's, it, there's, there's a sort of set of applications that people talk about, optimization and chemistry and material science and these things. Nobody really knows exactly which applications will come first or even turn out to be useful. Um, there's only one way to find out, and that's to experiment in applications research. You know, it would be great if we had a fault-tolerant, scalable machine uh, right now, but nobody does. It's still a long way away. So in the meantime, we have to do our best with the machines we've got. Sometimes you might hear the phrase, you know, we're in the NISC era, which is the era where we're dealing with relatively noisy, error-prone devices. In that era, the way we can try and make some progress in the short term is through hybrid algorithms. Uh, hybrid algorithms, you know, work iteratively. They use, they use machine learning processes, classical machine learning processes, to try and help quantum algorithms essentially train themselves over time to deal with the noise on a particular given machine at a particular point in time. So these are very iterative processes. You run a quantum, you run a quantum circuit um, or a quantum problem. You get the results back. You analyze them using ML techniques. You change the parameters. You go around the loop potentially thousands of times. That's hard to do. Right? That means you have to have priority on a machine. It means you have to have low latency in the system. And it means you have to have access to a large chunk of classical compute that you can easily orchestrate. As quantum machines get bigger, the amount of compute associated with these types of iterative cycles and pre- and post-processing scales horrendously. So having large amounts of classical compute you know, becomes a really important part of the system, could ultimately become a bottleneck. So one of the things that we you know, obviously struggle to do in the cloud is how can we leverage in amazing elastic amounts of, quantum com of classical compute to make these quantum machines better. Um, we launched a feature uh, a year or so ago, which we call Hybrid Jobs, which is specifically geared to running variational iterative algorithms in this NISC era, in the era of noisy machines. So one of the fastest growing features on the service, and uh, you know, some of the companies I'll talk about later, you know, have been using this feature to actually make some near-term progress. All right. Uh, so we're definitely in the experimental era right now. We're all about trying to squeeze that little bit of value uh, out of current hardware. But of course, the reason why you know, you're all here, the reason why this event is called Commercializing Quantum, is because we believe this, at the end of the day, you know, enters an era of, of disruption. Um, it's important to recognize that the technology itself is not what makes it disruptive. Right? Technology you know, is the focus of our attention in the experimental era, because it's all about trying to squeeze that last bit of value. Um, but as we move into the the commercialization phase, the technology is just an enabler, because at the end of the day, it's our customers that do the disrupting. Right? They're going to use this as a tool to go change the nature of some industry, you know, find a better material, build a better battery, whatever it might be. Um, so today, when we think about customers, you know, on the left-hand side in the experimental era, it's all about those pioneers. You know, so we heard from BMW, for example, this morning. A you know, great example of a company that is you know, committed to making quantum work. Um, 
But as we think about the future, we think about moving towards the mainstream, you know, that's a very different set of customers. They're not focused on quantum. They're not building teams right now. They're not waking up every morning saying, you know, hey, how can we make quantum work? You know, our job, I think, as an industry is to figure out how we can take quantum you know, to them, how we can make quantum part of their life. You know, they're busy. They're doing a whole bunch of really complicated problems today classically. They're using tools that have been developed you know, over the last couple of decades or so. They need, we need to find a way of, of quantum becoming part of their life. Um, the good news is a lot of those customers are in AWS right now. They're using the platform. You know, they're attracted to, to the cloud because of its scalability, right? because of its on-demand nature. The companies that will benefit most from quantum in the future are the companies that are running out of runway already with classical. They're hitting the limits of what they can achieve classically. If you, if you weren't hitting the limits classically, why would you bother playing with the quantum computer? You know, the whole point of quantum is to go past classical. So a lot of those customers are in AWS now. They're attracted to the cloud because of the elasticity of the place. Uh, so our job is to, how do we give those customers you know, the journey, you know, which is, again, is the theme of this session, um, from what they're doing today to steadily increase their use of quantum over time as the machines become more performance and the applications become developed. So it's not surprising that a lot of the software providers in the industry you know, are starting to talk much more about integration between the world of HPC uh, high performance compute and quantum computing. And it's, it's easy to, um, to think that somehow they've given up on quantum. You know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of mumbo jumbo gets spoken about, you know, the quantum winter. And we see a lot of quantum software providers talk a lot about HPC. It's not that they've given up on quantum computing, it's because they've essentially discovered, I think, that you need to bring quantum to the place where those customers are right now. Um, so I think they're on the right path. Um, I want to show you a couple of examples of how uh, some of our partners are doing this already. So first example is a company called Good Chemistry. So they're building this bridge. You know, they're essentially taking customers on a journey from classical tools today to incorporation of quantum tools in the future. Um, they've launched a, a product, a service called Chemist Cloud, which is a classical, purely classical uh, cloud service, runs on AWS. Uh, for simulating chemical systems. Um, they did a really, you know, really fascinating project just before Christmas um, with our impact computing group um, running a demo, million plus cores, uh, to try and simulate PFAS molecules. So these are the like, Teflons of the world, these chemicals that are indestructible, last forever, and are generally going to destroy our lives. Um, they focused on that. Really interesting. We just launched a blog, uh, co-authored with them uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, which has some code which tells you about how they did this. Uh, they just launched an open source uh, toolkit called Angelo, which integrates uh, quantum computing in the form of bracket uh, into that uh, toolkit. Another example, uh, they're also here today, uh, Quantify out of Denmark, um, this time focused on drug discovery, um, building applications that integrate uh, AWS HPC services, services like AWS, AWS Batch and Parallel Cluster uh, with bracket. Uh, if you're familiar with AWS, then you'll, you'll, you'll recognize this type of diagram. We love our little orange icons to essentially draw an, an, an architecture of something that's been built in the, in the cloud. Um, what's interesting about uh, Quantify is they worked with almost every hardware device that's available on Bracket. So they're an epitome of that customer that really wants to see how the devices vary from application to application. And, uh, and I'm thrilled that they, they just won a pretty sizable European innovation grant uh, to actually take this product to market, which is fantastic. Um, one more example, a company called Agnostic out of Canada. Uh, so they're not targeting a particular application. They're building an actual orchestration suite uh, called Covalent. It's open source, uh, which applies you know, generically. You can use it to manage uh, and orchestrate uh, combined quantum classical workloads across AWS HPC tools and services uh, and Amazon Bracket. Okay, so to wrap up, how do we get going? Um, so we see uh, Bracket as a place to go. We see it as a public square, as I mentioned, or Village Green, I suppose, if you're in England. Um, so if you're a solution provider, um, we have a phenomenal uh, partner team. Uh, I mentioned also that there's an AWS marketplace uh, where you can host your products and services. Um, if you're a researcher, we have a, we have a, a great uh, credit program, so apply for 
research credits, uh, not just for accessing Bracket, but for accessing AWS in general. If you have a hardware, uh, and there's some hardware developers in the room, you know, we're always interested in adding more interesting hardware to the service and just giving customers that bit more value. Uh, and obviously, you're an enterprise, um, just get started. You know, the tools are there right now. Uh, we have a dedicated professional services team uh, called the Quantum Solutions Lab that can help you. So, you know, we think the cloud's the way to go. Uh, it's a great way to access this technology. It's easy to get started. Um, it's really easy to combine classical and quantum stuff together, which is critical. It's where I think most of the first mover mainstream customers all already are. And I think collectively the platform gives those customers the ability to actually go uh, and be disruptors. Uh, so with that, I'll finish. Um, please come to our session uh, after all of these presentations are done. Uh, you know, come and, uh, and get a drink, come chat to us and INQ and, and uh, some of our other hardware partners that are here today. Thanks. Right. <clears throat> Thank you, Richard.